Welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to share with you a few tips about octave technique, about my own approach to octave playing, and we are going to analyze two quite contrasting famous octave spots from Liszt's Rhapsody number no. 6 and from a octave from an octave etude by Frédéric Chopin in B minor. So, what is important when we play octaves? Let's start from some general uh, general tips. Recently, I have watched a video uh, from uh, Tone Bass, I think, by a pianist who was uh, promoting an approach to play octaves mainly from the wrist. And the exercise to master this method was to lift your hand with a stable, uh, stable forearm and drop it like that on the keyboard. Uh, this method might work for some people, and I believe that some players might develop a fantastic technique using it, but uh, such methods, in my opinion, should come with a huge warning <laughs> warning sign, because uh, although they might be very useful for some people with stronger hands, especially for people who are professionally trained anyway from, uh, from an early childhood, but for people with weaker hands and with uh, for adult beginners especially, these um, strength-oriented learning methods might be actually quite dangerous that's why just be careful with them don't overdo them and just stop practicing like that if you feel any kind of um, sore hands or fatigue or pains <clears throat> my personal approach to octaves is uh, a bit more ergonomic in my opinion and i mostly use gravity and motion coordination in order to handle octave passages so what happens when uh, we play an octave. Let's have, have a closer look. So, in my approach, uh, I mostly use gravity, basically just falling down on the keyboard. So we raise the forearm, and then we allow that, let's make that as the first exercise, the first step of mastering this technique. We raise the forearm, and then we drop it, like that. Not focusing the fingers, just feel the weight of your hand, feel how powerful it is actually if you just allow your hand to drop on the keyboard freely. Uh, step number two would be, of course, uh, focusing fingers. Focusing fingers one and five, but we focus them only at the very last moment. So we raise the forearm, fingers are absolutely relaxed, and then we fall down, focusing fingers only at the very last moment. Boom. This is very similar to a weapon motion. The rope is relaxed, but at the very end of the motion, it bites. Pish, like that. So this is basically how you could play octaves. Focusing fingers only at the very end of the motion and releasing them immediately after the hit. So you reach the bottom and you release the fingers. You don't pull them up. So this is wrong, but you just shut off the electricity in your fingers. And you let them leave. Uh, you let them stay on the keyboard like that. Boom. Like that. If you would like to keep working on uh, optimization of your technical skills, you might check out my courses dedicated to technical aspects uh, and musical, but primarily technical aspects of piano playing, dedicated to uh, 51 exercise of uh, Brahms or to Hainan exercises where I explain a lot of useful concepts and tricks about piano playing. In our first example today, in uh, the famous Liszt Rhapsody, at the first, uh, as a first stage, I would suggest you to uh, master one octave at a time, making sure that you use gravity, focusing fingers only at the very last moment, and releasing them after each hit. So we start from a comfortable tempo, release. And while you release your fingers, you raise your forearm and move your hand to, toward the next position. And you see your hands, your fingers, they stay really close to the keys. You just move your forearm. Like that. <clears throat> and let's have a look what actually happens when we hit an octave. The question is where we have... Uh, stability, how we distribute stability in our hand. Because when we have a comfortable position, like let's say a chord, like C major chord in its root version, here we have most of the stability in the knuckles. And the thumb is supported in the first joint that connects the thumb to the forearm. So basically in the wrist here. Wrist for the thumb and knuckles for the rest of the fingers. The rest of the thumb 
is only partially tense, so we have not so much tension, not so much stability in the wrist. Most of the stability goes toward the knuckles and a little bit toward the, th toward the wrist where we use the thumb. And that allows us a great flexibility and cushioning with the wrist. So we can release the hand, we can, uh, we can rotate with the hand for different uh, groups and stuff. But when we play octave or some white chords, we have to raise our wrist. We have to transfer the, a part of that stability from uh, knuckles to the wrist. So we distribute it rather like 50-50. So here it's like 70-30 maybe. So we have a huge room for cushioning in the wrist. And here we have like 50-50 maybe, or maybe like 55-45 or something like that. But what is not good if your uh, knuckles are fallen completely. Like this is quite common for octave playing and that's a very limiting habit. Uh, unfortunately, there is not much we can do uh, if you play like that. That's why uh, if you uh, play like that, I would suggest you to activate, to learn how to activate uh, knuckles bridge nevertheless in the octaves. Like that. And these fingers, they are more or less relaxed. They're not crouched, they're not lifted up. I would not I would not hold any static tension in them. I would rather hold them close to the keys and not really tense. Of course, avoiding some accidental some accidental press notes, but nevertheless not really making them tense, but activating knuckles instead. So that form, that shape, is nevertheless quite important for octave playing. Of course, for people with smaller hands that barely reach octaves, uh, it's difficult. Yeah? For example, if I would play tenth, I can't really hold stability in the, uh, in the knuckles anymore because it's just extremely wide for me. That's why uh, there is not much uh, what we can do, that's just a limiting uh, factor, but nevertheless there are some tips about relaxation, about um, groupings and stuff, and stuff. And I have a special video with some tips uh, for people with smaller hands. Uh, however, for everyone who has, uh, let's say, a standard uh, size of the hand, uh, make sure that you work on the stability, on the stability of the knuckle bridge. That's essential. <clears throat> And uh, returning to our uh, list Rhapsody, at first what we have to do here is to work on each particular octave and acquire that habit of dropping your hand, focusing fingers at the very last moment, then releasing them and raising the forearm just a tiny bit to remove your hand to the next position. Then. As soon as we feel comfortable with that, in a comfortable tempo and comfortable dynamics, like mezzo forte and let's say andante. So at, as soon as this feels comfortable, you start grouping them in larger groups, in groups of four notes, but always separating the first note. So you play the first octave and you separate it and you release the hand. And then you group them from the second uh, 16 note leading to the next strong beat. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Ta -ta 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 -ta. And at this point, we combine those uh, acquired motions with relaxation between octaves and one larger motion of the arm. So now we uh, use the whole arm. We also use the upper arm in order to play those groups in a flow. So four notes in a flow. Like that. Uh, then we raise tempo. So you play that in, in an original tempo, in a uh, tempo you intend for this piece, but making gaps between groups. And then you make groups of eight notes uh, following the same principle and so on. For repeated notes, in order to play repeated notes uh, more or less efficiently, we have to at first master uh, something that I call ricochet technique. Uh, ricochet as a reflection, yeah? so the first octave we play on a certain impulse and the second one comes as a reflection of the first one, like that. 
So you see that there is a one motion of the arm, one impulse of the arm, but two jumpy motions of the wrist. For that, we of course have to release fingers between hits. And you play them kind of a, on different motions, like down, forward. You see, so the motions of the head are different. You can also practice like out of the keyboard, in the keyboard, out, in, like contrary motions, and then just down, forward, down, forward, until you can, until you get them kind of blended, like that, until you can play them on one motion. Then groups of three notes, same principle. The first one is your impulse, and two, notes two and three uh, are reflections, like that. So this is very similar uh, sensation. A sensation is very similar as if you would have a flat stone and you would throw it horizontally towards the surface of the water and the stone starts jumping on the water. Mm. Yeah, that's why I call it uh, ricochet. And then larger groups, like groups of five notes. And then even larger groups, but when you play more than, let's say, eight notes, you start bouncing with the wrist in the process. So a bit lower, higher, lower, higher. <clears throat> and then gradually you will develop uh, an ability to play many octaves in a row uh, using this technique, but of course it would take a few days. You have to practice a few days like that. And for leaps, like there are a few leaps, and when we have such leaps we at first, also break them into pairs and work on each pair separately. Mm. At first, breaking that uh, after the first note. Palm release, following ricochet and releasing the hand between groups. Release, release, like that. Then, oppositely, like that. This method is great because if you have a, a some some especially tricky leap like this one you can loop it and work on it a few times in a row until you feel comfortable and then groups of four notes but again stop after the first one and play four four notes in a row and also one momentum so two first octaves go a bit lower and two other octaves go a bit higher with the wrist so you kind of you have half uh, a half circle here like that until you can play that through so this is a great uh, way of learning octaves that i really do recommend you and now let's have a look at the contrasting um, contrasting example from chopin etude in b minor in this piece we have quite a different aesthetics so aesthetics of chopin was uh, quite different to Liszt. Uh, when Liszt has uh, preferred some bravura style, virtuoso elements, uh, Chopin would rather choose legato singing and very gentle, very delicate um, approach. And this etude promotes exactly these qualities. And for that, we have to keep in mind a few things. So let's have a look at this study. At first, of course, making sure that our thumbs are quite loose, so we don't think much about physical legato in the uh, thumbs voice, but rather about sensation of looseness in these parts of the hands. So I would suggest you at first practice like that, without uh, physical legato, just staying close to the keys and avoiding accents, just making them... You can make some waves of crescendo when you go upwards, some small waves of crescendo, but nevertheless, loose hands, no legato. And then we add uh, upper voices. And when we play octaves, at first I would suggest you to coordinate motions uh, in the following way. So when you, when you have black keys, you play these octaves in the keyboard like that boom and when you play uh, when you have white keys you go out like that
here we have two octaves out and then in. So when we have white keys, this is kind of one motion, and then in. That's a very helpful trick, and it's very similar to playing just normal chromatic scales. Out, in, out, in, out, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, out, in. So this is how we can play uh, chromatic scales in order to reach uh, quite a lot of strength without any effort. Same thing for octaves. So at first, uh, organizing them like that. When you have accents like uh, these ones, you have just to uh, move these keys faster in order to produce an accented sound. And for that, we might raise the forearms, releasing the fingers here. So free up the fingers, raise the forearms, and just drop your hands on the accented note. Drop, raise, drop. So just using gravity and experimenting with how little physical effort uh, you have to use here. Basically not much. And when we get to uh, the mm, spot in bar 5, when we have to hold these notes, it's also important to notice that, uh, first of all, these accents, they relate, in my opinion, they relate uh, to those middle notes. And octaves continue playing in a float. So I would not accent octaves, but I would accent solely those middle notes. That would provide us with some polyphony yeah? and would not sound too bombastic. <clears throat> And also, at first, separating the first note and making sure that you can free up your hands while holding that chord. So focus and release immediately. And free up, move around a bit, make sure that you are free here. And then you start phrasing them from the second eighth note. Release. Use gravity in order to hit the next chord. Free up. Release. Gravity and free up. You see, so we free up twice, before the chord, before the marked chord, and after it. Release, 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 release. So this is basically what happens here. And then we smoothen all that. Yes, and so on. So it's always the same principle. And then we improve legato. As soon as we have, uh, art, as soon as we have coordinated motions, we improve legato. For that, we uh, work with pedaling and phrasing. And we always think in groups of six notes, starting from the second triplet note. So we play the first note without an accent, gently, and we start from the second eighth note. <laughs> And we create crescendo, but smoothening the third beat. So we avoid accents on the strong beats unless composer wants us to. Yeah. So in the beginning, creating a wave and smoothening the strong beat. Always like that. And then. And here already we have accents on strong beats. So you always think from the second eighth note and phrase it accordingly. Same principle uh, applies to the middle section of this piece. When I have those beautiful octaves, <laughs> I find this middle section actually much more difficult than um, faster sections because uh, it's very easy to make unnecessary accents that would kill your um, legato or it's uh, very easy to mess up with pedal because pedal here must be really masterful in order to provide that ultimate sensation of legato and smoothness in both voices in these octaves that's why i would suggest you to actually start with the thumb you play the thumb without thinking much about physical legato but you think about phrasing you think about a sensation of looseness in this part of the arm and you train your pedaling in order to in order to help you achieve some phrasing and legato.
practicing with the thumb first and then adding the fifth finger but always thinking about motifs that start from the second eighth note release so at, at first I would suggest you to practice like that always gently smoothening strong beats so you create a wave but you smoothen the strong beat that would allow you to avoid accents on strong beats and improve phrasing and this uh, rounded singing sensation of these phrases so i hope these tips were helpful please don't forget to like this video uh, subscribe to my channel leave a comment all that helps me tremendously see you next time and have fun playing piano